Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on your location. I know we've got a lot of global participants with us today. Welcome. Uh, this is Brooke Aikens, and on behalf of Q1 Productions and IBA Industrial, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar and thank you for joining us. Uh, today's webinar will have a case study focus on project experience with eBeam. Uh, we're very lucky to have two speakers with us today. Uh, Candice Nagel, who is the Sales Manager of America for IBA Industrial, as well as Mr. Pete Baker, who's an electron beam consultant and founder, I'm sorry, founder of Quantum EBX. Um, and again, they'll be presenting a case study perspective on project experience with eBeam. Uh, a reminder that IBA Industrial will be back next week with us with the next chapter in our series entitled What X-Ray Brings to You, uh, X-Ray versus Other Modalities and Comparison Case Study. Um, and this will be taking place next Thursday, uh, March 25th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Time, and I will be in touch later in the presentation with a uh, link to register for that meeting. Uh, please note that a copy of today's presentation recording will be sent to all registered attendees uh, later today, and it will also be uh, available later on the IBA Industrial YouTube page. We have de dedicated some time for question and answer after today's presentation, and you can submit your questions and comments for our speakers at any time during the presentation via the Q&A feature that is on your Zoom toolbar. Um, again, feel free to drop your questions and comments in there at any time during the presentation. And I do encourage you to be as specific as possible when sending these questions through. Uh, please feel free to include an example or reference back to a particular area within the presentation to better assist Pete and Candice in thoroughly answering your questions. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenters and I'll begin with Candice Nagel. Uh, Candice is the sales manager at IBA Industrial in charge of the Americas region. She joined IBA in 2017 as an R&D project manager and led key projects for IBA Industrial, including the development of solid state amplifiers and the engineering of a 40 MeV rototron. Uh, Candace moved to the US in 2019 to take on her new role as the sales manager for the Americas. We also have Mr. Pete Baker. Uh, Pete has over 30 years of experience in high energy electron beam radiation processing and has extensive knowledge in electron beam dose mapping and specialized in complicated and challenging product uh, ge geometrics, excuse me, and dose radiation limitations. Uh, in 2019, Pete founded Quantum EBX to explore new opportunities in high energy electron beam and X-ray processing technologies and to assist medical device companies customers uh, to navigate through sterilization options and develop sustainable long-term strategies. Um, at this time, it's my honor to hand it over to our presenters today, and we will begin with Candice, who will be speaking first. Hi, everyone, and thank you again for joining us today. So let's first set up again the context for e-beam sterilization by looking at the healthcare sterilization market and its trends. As mentioned by Byron Lambert during the first webinar, the sterilization market is dominated by ETO, 50%, and Gamma, 40%. E-beam and X-ray technologies only represent about 5% of the market, and other technologies count for the remaining 5%. Both incumbents are, however, facing significant challenges. As mentioned during the first webinar, the ETO industry is under significant pressure from environmental agencies with regard to health hazards linked to high emission levels. ETO residuals in medical devices intended for low-weight patients, such as babies, have also been pointed out as problematic. Gamma is also confronted with security and supply chain concerns. Over the last years, availability of cobalt have been strained. So regulatory uh, hurdle and availability are therefore key drivers for adopting eBeam as a sterilization technology. But eBeam also presents unique advantages of its own. The possibility to use it not only for sterilization, but also for materials improvements benefiting from its cross-linking properties, a high dose rate, reducing in some cases materials degradation and for the same reason, faster processing times than ETO and Gamma. Of course, ETO and Gamma are and will remain instrumental sterilization technologies. But alternative technologies such as E-beam and X-ray 
are proven economically sound technologies to diversify the sterilization portfolio and mitigate risks in a challenging environment for incumbent technologies. So how does this translate on the market? Let's consider the install base of eBeam, X-Ray and Duo. Just as a side note, Duo refers to eBeam and X-Ray capabilities within the same unit. What you see on the left-hand side is the accumulated installed base by year of order across all equipment providers worldwide. We are talking about roughly 130 units in operation for sterilization purpose in 2019. Let's keep in mind that these numbers bear a lot of uncertainties, given many eBeam and X-ray users do not communicate about their sterilization units. So considering the units we know are installed worldwide, we can estimate a compounded annual growth of about 15% between 2015 and 2019. Let's take a narrower but also more robust set of data points, such as the system sold by IBA and MEVEX, one of IBA's key competitors. This is the graph shown on the right-hand side, again with the accumulated install base over time. Over the period 2016 to 2019, an average of 12 systems per year were sold across both companies. Prior to 2016, five units on average were sold per year. Across both companies, we're talking about a compounded annual growth of more than 20% between 2015 and 2019. The actual increase in market share of eBeam and X-Ray will depend on how this growth differs and places the overall sterilization market growth. But given the double-digit growth number shown here, and compared to single-digit growth generally assumed for the sterilization market, 5%, 8%, it is clear that eBeam and X-Ray are gaining grounds in the market. Let's look into more details at who is developing eBeam projects and why. Service Center offering sterilization services to customers in the healthcare sector represent about 60% of the market. Medical device manufacturers developing their own in-house sterilization capability make the remaining 40%. The choice of medical device manufacturers to go for in-house versus service center will depend on a variety of factors. In-house sterilization can be a very natural fit for manufacturers who are looking to integrate the sterilization step within their assembly process. It can be because only a specific subassembly needs to be sterilized, and so sterilization, sterilizing the full package product would not be efficient. Sometimes sterilizing the full product instead of the critical subassembly can lead to damages to other subcomponents. We mentioned earlier the faster cycling time of eBeam compared to other technologies. In-house sterilization enables to speed the process even more by avoiding time lost in logistics and transport of the products to and from the service center. This could be a strong requirement depending on the customer business model and or the nature of the product itself. In-house equipment can typically have their configuration fully optimized to the specific products to be treated. This contrasts with service centers which aim at developing a configuration that fits the largest variety of products possible. Finally, R&D development might be more easily handled by having the equipment and being readily available in-house. On the other hand, service centers have extensive experience in the sterilization process. While there is no skills required that cannot be acquired over time, with training, internal, internalizing sterilization demands and enables to have more control in a process that might have not been a core activity for the company previously. As we will see in more details in the coming slides, an e-beam sterilization equipment requires significant civil works in order to build the shielding surrounding the equipment. It always depends on the contract with the service center, but typically the level of commitment, at least with regards to the location of the equipment, is therefore more important than outsourcing the sterilization. In the same way, eBeam and X-Ray are increasingly perceived as valuable alternatives to mitigate the risks associated with gamma and EBO, the choice for in-house or service center is also about providing optionality and diversifying a company's sterilization portfolio. Total cost and return on investment is, of course, a critical factor, and with no single answer as to which modality 
which model in-house or service center is cheaper. It depends on the products, volume, the location, and all the drivers and applicable factors we have been discussing up to now. Each project will have its own story. And in the rest of this presentation, we will show an example of a story, a case study, to illustrate practically what is an EBIM project. We will aim at staying as generic as possible to cover the following points, timeline, capex, opex, and key steps in the implementation of an EBIM center. So let's take a concrete example of an EBIM project and follow the story from the very first idea up to the operation of the plant. We can divide the project timeline in six main phases. The preparation phase from the first discussion to the project activation, the site selection phase, the construction phase up to the building occupancy date, the installation up to the release note of the equipment, the operation start during which product qualification is finalized and production is ramped up, and finally the grow and maintain phase for the many following years. The Rodotron has a lifetime of 20 years plus, so this last phase, although represented by a short arrow, is actually the main game. The heat of the work is by then behind us, and this period is primarily written by the routine operation preventive maintenance, with also the possibility to increase the capacity if needed. I will go through the, present, the preparation phase in more details with a key focus on the business case. As you can see on the timeline, the preparation phase dur duration varies a lot from one customer to the other. It will typically be from one year, one year and a half, up to several years, depending on the customer's internal process and product qualification scope and strategy. Solution design and product qualification have been extensively addressed in the prior webinars. So we won't spend a lot of time on this and we will focus on the business case and financing phase to address for our project what type of budget we're talking about. Once the project is activated and up to the start of operation, we are typically talking about 18 months. <coughs> but I will let Pete Baker present these phases in more details, given his experience, extensive experience in developing and operating EBIM plants on the customer side. As mentioned in the first webinar, it all starts with the product. What are the dimensions? What is the average density? What is the minimum dose required? the maximum dose acceptable, and which configuration enables to stay within the appropriate dose range, which volumes are we talking about in year one, in year five, after, can you flip the products? Beyond the technical requirements, there might be some other requirements that should be communicated. Is there any particular reliability requirements that any downtime, even small, will be very problematic? We might want to consider redundancy of some equipment in this case any specific timing requirements for project completion, process requirements with regard to automation, any footprint requirements because of a very specific site in mind, is the equipment installed in an existing building. Let's assume to respond to these questions that the customer has been through the product qualification process. You will recognize the Petri dishes with plated media products which were the object of the second part of the product qualification webinar. For the sake of this case study, we are considering that this product is a good representative product of the variety of products the customer wants to treat with EV. I would like to make clear that the volume in question, irradiation prices, and any other parameter assumed in this case study are fictive and not representative of class labor specific context. The customer requirements are the following. Products are boxes with dimensions of 40 centimeters on 20 centimeters on 18 centimeters. The average density of 0.2 gram per cubic centimeters and the minimum dose to be applied is 15 kilograms. The product qualification has shown that by irradiating laterally in double site, the DUR will remain within the acceptable dose range. The full facility is about 2,700 square meters or 30,000 uh, square feet size. The product cannot be flipped. Reliability and timing expectations are standard. And finally, volume are expected to grow over time because the customer wants to progressively transfer products to the new facility and due to market growth. 
The initial volume shown here is taken over the first six months of operation and amounts to approximately 8,300 cubic meters or 300,000 cubic feet. Volume will grow up to 70,000 cubic meters or 2.5 million cubic feet on year four of operation and then stabilize for the remaining years. In this, the solution design activity can now start. The core components of the solutions are the accelerator, conveyor, control system, dosimetry, and the safety system. Far from being standalone components, they each need to be designed as part of an integrated solution. IBA, as the equipment provider, develops and supplies to its customer the integrated solution tailored to their needs. It is possible to remove one component or the other from the IDA scope, but the integration work to ensure all the components work well together remain essential. Shielding is, of course, an integral part of the solution as well. And while it falls out of IDA scope, the development of the layout is made in close collaboration between all parties, customer, a &E, general contractor, IBA, and any third party for shielding calculation validation. The level of automation to support the material handling process is variable from one site to the other. Several factors will be put in the balance, such as avoided labor costs, additional capex, the wish for minimizing human error sources, etc. So the solution design stage leads us to consider a TT200 at 10 MeV electron beam energy and 30 kilowatt beam power. The pulse technology is selected to improve the electrical efficiency of the system. With 30 kilowatt beam power, we can treat 10 boxes per minute, or the equivalent of 6 seconds per box. These consider the Petri dishes representative products at 15 kg minimum. For products with a higher density or requiring a higher minimum dose, the treatment time will be increased, and inversely for products with lower density or lower minimum dose. At this space, we might want to consider automation, but for this particular case study, it has been decided um, to staff um, based on no added automation system, whether palletizer, depalletizer, or automated vehicles. Keeping the same beam power, you can ramp up the treatment time or sheets in order to follow an increase in volume. This is the option that has been considered in this case study but you could also increase the beam power to meet your volume. To the caveat, of course, that it remains within the limit of the conveyor. But so what does our project look like? What we can see here is a lateral E-beam layout. The footprint for the accelerator shielding and conveyor spans over approximately 1,300 square meters or 14,000 square feet. This does not include storage or office space. Only strictly essential space are shown here, such as the cooling, power supply, spare parts, and control rooms. In order to visualize the space in question, and maybe just for tennis practitioners like me, you will see on the left-hand side the size of a tennis court and how it compares to our layout. Thick concrete walls can be observed around the accelerator and also in the irradiation area. Cumulated, we are talking about more than three meters concrete in each direction in order to maintain radiation levels outside the vault below public levels. In total, we are talking about 1,720 cubic meters or 60,750 cubic feet of concrete. This will be further discussed as part of the project business case. Now that we have our solution design, let's go to it. The graph on the left gives for our specific case study an estimated capex of about 10 to 15 million USD. This encompasses everything from the land, warehouse, accelerator and conveyor to the dosimetry system, process control system uh, and, and so process control system or pieces. Sorry. The general building and land is probably what will represent the majority of the budget, 40% in our example, followed by the accelerator and the conveyor roughly 20 person each. The shielding uh, cost for the vault around the equipment and irradiation area is highly dependent on the concrete cost. Using the concrete volume mentioned previously and $500 per cubic meters concrete cost, the shielding is the next major cost component but represents less than 10% of the capex. 
Operating costs for a case study increase over time as the project progresses and volume increases. The first year, partial labor costs and fixed costs are being considered to support the setup of the plant. This is totaling about $300,000 in our example. Once the plant is operational, the staffing is increased progressively uh, and to the labor cost should be added cost for maintenance and electricity. At full capacity, the total operational cost considered for this case study amounts to roughly $2 per year. Pete Baker will go into more details as to how the staff is growing over time and which profile is needed when. It is at this point in the project that the unit cost can be calculated by considering the annual OPEX and depreciated CAPEX. Again, in this very specific example, we can see a very high unit cost on the second year because the plant operates only six months over the year and at reduced capacity with one shift. The unit costs will stabilize over time down to about $38 per cubic meters as costs are amortized over large volumes. Adding on top of the cost analysis, the expected revenues for service center or avoided costs for center, this enables us to estimate a return on investment for the project and a payback period. It is important for in-house customer to include in the avoided cost the cost of logistics related to outsourcing sterilization. For this case study, we have considered an avoided cost or sterilization uh, price of $100 per cubic meters or $2.8 per cubic feet leading to a payback of three to four years after start of operation and 20% return on investment. The key takeaway here is by no means to remember the payback and return on investment values. These will change from one project to the other, and so will the CAPEX and the OPEX. What we wanted to illustrate here are the key steps followed before project activation to evaluate a project feasibility and economic viability. So our case study is positive. The project is meeting return expectations. And the customer's organization is validating its strategic importance. On my side, this is the moment when as sales manager, I transferred the project to the operation departments of IDA. A project manager is assigned to the project. And while I remain an essential contact person, the project manager becomes the first line of communication. I will now let Pete walk you through the rest of the journey. Greetings, everyone. Today, I hope to give you an idea of what to expect when you move forward with an electron beam installation project. I'll present an overview of the installation process. And because much of my own experience comes from operating an e-beam processing operation, I'll describe some important elements needed to transition from an installation project into a commercial operation. A well-designed e-beam system is tailored to meet the day-to-day -day needs of the end user. And because of this, there just wouldn't be enough time to describe all the potential variations. So today I'll pick up the case study that Candice described earlier in her presentation. The case study is a good example of a medical device sterilization project and contains most of the common elements that are part of an e-beam installation. So let's get started. We begin after the preparation phase that Candice described is complete and the purchase contract has been signed. This leaves us with five remaining phases. The first three phases are site selection, construction, and installation. Each phase will take six months to complete or one and a half years in total. After that, the next phase covers the first six months after the installation and consists of product qualification and the start of commercial operations. The final phase describes the following three years of commercial operations. So let's start with phase one. This phase begins with the site selection and ends when we're ready to start construction. This phase will last six months. For this project, We'll form a team of people to help with the installation, and then the same people will transition into the staff that runs the commercial facility. After the start of this project, the project manager manages the overall installation, hires an architectural and engineering or A&E contractor, and will work with the accelerator supplier to fine tune any remaining design elements. 
a medical device company like the one in our case study may have this resource available internally. When the contract for eBeam system has been signed, we agree to a 12 month delivery date. When this date arrives, we need a site that's ready to receive the equipment for installation. Sometimes this date is referred to as the building occupancy date or BOD. The main point here is that the clock is ticking and we need to get to work. The first thing we need to do is find a home for our new e-beam system. And we've decided to purchase an empty lot and build everything from the ground up. To help us with our search, we'll use a document that the accelerator supplier gave us, the building interface specification. This document defines the building requirements for the e-beam operation that we've purchased and includes the minimum structural, mechanical, and electrical requirements to use for the building. Also, we've analyzed our processing volume estimates and we need a lot large enough for a 2,700 square meter or 29,000 square foot building. This will give us enough room for the e-beam concrete shield, conveyor system, warehouse storage, and office and workspaces that will be needed for the operation. To meet our expected storage demands, we need nine meter or 30 foot high ceilings and four full height dock doors. During the site selection process, a good A&E contractor can be invaluable. These contractors have knowledge of local agencies and common permitting constraints and are aware of regional norms and traditions. They typically know the best construction contractors and can build the final construction design to best match the locality. The value that a good A&E contractor can provide cannot be understated. While we search for our site, we need to order some important equipment. The interface specification document will also include a list of equipment that must be purchased by us, the customer. At the start of phase one, we'll be mostly concerned with equipment that may have long lead times. Specifically for this project, we'll need to purchase a secondary water cooling or chiller system, an ozone exhaust system, and a fire suppression system. This equipment will be ordered as soon as possible to make sure it's installed prior to the e-beam system installation date. During this phase, we'll hire the operations first employee, the general manager. This person will look closely at the project manager and will be responsible for hiring the new staff. For this case study, this possession is best filled by somebody who has experience in the sterilization operation and may have worked in an e-beam or gamma or EO sterilization plant in the past. Also, the general manager will have experience that will help the team build the operating procedures and organization needed to transition into a functioning e-beam facility. Once we've purchased the land, we can firm up our project plan. We'll hire a general contractor that will build the site to our specifications and agree to meet key milestones. Primarily, the building must be ready on our planned building occupancy date or the equipment installation will be delayed. We'll also need to add any product qualification work like dose setting and material testing that can be started before the commercial go live. This testing was described in chapter one of this webinar series and can be performed using other e-beam sources. It could take many weeks or even months to complete these tests, so it's very important we plan for them early in the process. Also, we need to plan for any regulatory filings that may be needed prior to commercial operation. These tasks are on the critical path of our project plan and have the potential to delay our commercial go live if they're not completed on time. The project plan will contain many detailed tasks, but these are good examples of tasks that need to be planned early on. Now we can move to phase two. This phase starts with the initial building construction and then when the site is ready for system installation. This phase will last six months. Construction will start with the building basics. The foundation will be laid, walls will be tilted up, and the main entry points for electrical and water distribution will be installed. Once the work starts, it should move pretty quickly. This e-beam plant will operate in compliance with ISO standards and US FDA requirements. 
because the company in our case study is a medical device manufacturer, we'll assume that a quality system already exists. Although we don't need to create a new system, we will need to create the policies and procedures for this new e-beam installation. Employee safety laws and standards will also require procedures, postings, and training, and our machine-based radiation source will require licensing. The details of this licensing requirement depends on the region, but will always require a radiation safety program of some kind. Key people will be brought on board during this phase. These new people include a quality assurance manager who will work with the advanced product validation effort, but will be responsible for licensing and regulatory filings as well. We'll lead the effort to create the quality system components needed for the sterilization operation when it's up and running. A maintenance manager will be responsible for plant and equipment maintenance and will be useful for on-site monitoring and problem solving. This person will benefit from seeing the construction site evolve, will gain valuable knowledge from the trade people during construction, establish important lo local contacts, and build relationships with them. An operations manager will work with the accelerator and conveyor manufacturer to help finish site-specific process control system details and interfaces. This person will also work with the quality assurance manager to develop process procedures and work instructions. This person will also help with on-site monitoring and may participate in factory acceptance testing and training later in this phase. An operator will help with various lower level tasks and will run errands for the plant. It's helpful to have someone like this around. So we'll hire somebody that can stay on the team when the plant becomes operational. This person can also assist with site monitoring and security, but more importantly, will become acquainted with the site and the operation, acquiring knowledge that can help train new operators later on. A safety officer, radiation safety officer actually, will be needed. This is an important job, but can be assigned to any of the management positions as a collateral duty. The role will be needed to administer the radiation safety program for license compliance. Outsource training is available for certification and should be available locally or online. These responsibilities will be combined with the employee's health and safety program, making radiation safety an important component of a strong safety culture. During this phase, we'll start conducting safety, quality, and dissymmetry training. Good outsourced dissymmetry courses are available, but they typically only occur twice a year. So we'll need to schedule this training as early as possible. Training will continue nonstop up to and after the plant starts operating. This is crucial to having a capable and competent staff that can transition to commercial operations when the e-beam system is ready. Toward the end of this phase, construction efforts are focused on the equipment installation. The concrete shield is framed and poured and set. Wiring is run to different electrical distribution points and plumbing is in place for water cooling systems. Ventilation ducts are installed and equipment room floors are finished and glazed. During the construction period, it's important to develop a strong safety culture to avoid accidents. We'll also make sure that someone from our staff is at the site every day to monitor progress, resolve problems and answer questions. This will help prevent construction delays. We'll also check in with suppliers frequently to make sure they're on schedule. We won't assume everything's going to plan, we'll verify it. When the e-beam and conveyor system manufacturer process is complete, factory testing will be conducted. The conveyor and control system tests are typically the most important tests to attend in person. And this could be a good learning experience for the operations or maintenance manager. Once all the testing is complete, the equipment can be shipped to the site. The supplier will make shipping arrangements and provide proper handling instructions for the equipment when it arrives. When the equipment does arrive, a rigging crew and a crane will be used to move the accelerator and other heavy systems into place. We'll schedule the rigging crew as early as possible to lock in their availability. We'll also verify with the e-beam system supplier that the riggers will have all the right equipment at the site when the time comes. By the end of this phase, the concrete shield will be poured and set 
and the long lead time equipment will be installed, making the site ready to receive the new e-beam system. Now we can move to phase three. This phase starts with the installation of the equipment and ends when the e-beam system is released for operation. This phase will take six months. For the first half of phase three, the new system is assembled in place. The accelerator and conveyor systems are installed, the electrical lines are run, and the plumbing and ventilation systems are finished. This period is filled with long days and environment can be very stressful. It's important to make efforts to keep people healthy and productive. The staff will use this opportunity for learning by working closely with the installers that have experience with the equipment. During installation, construction on the site will continue, except it'll be focused primarily on other areas of the building. It's important for other trade workers to stay out of the installer's way unless they're, they're needed and the gen general contractor will be made keenly aware of this. When everything can be turned on and testing can begin, the first series of tests will start by checking really the foundational elements of the overall system, verifying the installation meets the criteria defined in approved drawings and specifications, and ensuring supporting systems are calibrated and function functioning correctly. Installation Qualification Testing, or IQ, is the first set of tests to be performed. These tests are focused on the accelerator and conveyor operation. Excellent references are available that describe these tests in detail. They are ISO 11137-3, which provides overall requirements. AMI ISO TIR 29, which provides more specific guidance on performing the tests and ISO ASTM 1469, which prevents descriptions of the testing in great detail. The installation team is responsible for cut, conducting the IQ test, and some examples of them are shown on screen. We don't have time to describe them all in detail, but these tests are designed to test the individual characteristics of the processing system. The dissimetry system must be in place and calibrated to perform these tests. And this E-beam installation will be using CTA strips and thin film dissimeter packets for this purpose. It's very important for the plant staff to know how to conduct these tests because they'll be responsible for performing them in the future for either routine checks or to requalify the equipment after repairs. Also knowing how these tests are performed and what they mean helps operators and maintenance workers understand how the system behaves when everything is working properly. This is another opportunity for us to learn from the experts and the experience will provide great value to the staff in the future. After IQ testing is complete, operational qualification or OQ testing can be performed. Remember that IQ testing focused primarily on the individual components of the system. OQ testing focuses on the system as a whole, on how everything works together. These tests can also be found in the references I mentioned earlier, and OQ and IQ tests themselves can easily be the subject of an entire webinar session. In essence, OQ testing consists of mapping the dose distribution in different materials of size and density over a range the plant expects to encounter during routine operations. The results of the test will provide knowledge of potential high and low dose areas, as well as symmetry and uniformity characteristics. For example, the image on the screen is a three-dimensional plot of material processed in a metal carrier. The high doses at the front and back are the areas where the material is touching the walls of the metal carrier, and the low doses at the areas around the sides are surrounded by air. These edge effects were described in detail in chapter two of this webinar series. But the important thing to know right now is that these tests will help us understand what to expect when we start dose mapping real product. E-beam plants routinely operate using what's called reference dissymmetry. Again, I'll refer to our chapter two webinar for the details, but the method that our plant will use will be tested and characterized during OQ. 
This testing will validate a key component of the dose mapping process and establish a foundation for process control mechanisms going forward. As the results of OQ testing will provide insight into dose absorption characteristics and establish baseline for dose distribution expectations. Dose uh, dosimeter placement rationale during the product qualification or PQ phase can be based on the evidence provided by these tests. Once again, this is another valuable learning opportunity for the plant staff. The IQ and OQ test records will be very important in the future and will likely be requested during almost every audit and inspection the plant will encounter. For this reason, our quality manager will monitor the process and ensure these records are in order with all the T's crossed and all the I's dotted. Nobody leaves until everything is complete and properly signed and dated. It's just too hard to correct these records after everyone's gone home. While installation and testing is taking place, other work will be progressing as well. All the product validation work that could be performed in advance will, will be complete and any product regulatory filings, if required, will be done as well. The equipment operating instructions provided by the e-beam supplier will be incorporated into the plant's quality system and maintenance schedules. Other procedures, forms, labels, and tags will also be ready to go. By now, the entire team will have worked on and been trained to all the quality system elements that are needed to start processing real product. During this phase, we'll add two more people. A dosimetry technician will be hired prior to start of all that testing and will be responsible for much of these tasks later when the plant is running on its own. The position is responsible for dose mapping and all things related to dosimetry, including dosimeter reading, calibration, storage, and managing dosimeter inventories. An office manager position is needed to start preparing for the commercial operation. The position will deal with internal customer support and will manage office functions and will handle some plant level human resource duties as well. Once all the testing is complete, the system will be released for commercial operation. At the end of phase three, the staff will consist of seven people. We're ready now to move to phase four. This phase starts with product qualification and ends with the plant routinely processing products. This phase will last six months. Since much of the product validation will be completed in advance, we'll only need to perform the dose mapping component. The OQ experience will help us optimize product configurations and dissimilar placements. When complete, the product dose mapping results will allow us to set up a processing recipe in the control system and establish a range for our reference dissimilar. Refer to chapter two of this webinar series for a description of the actual product dose mapping ex exercise. The final touches to the site will be completed with furnished offices, a nicely paved parking lot and green landscaping around the building. Inside the warehouse, lines will, will be painted on the floor and nice new signage will be posted to identify different areas. Two new operators will be added to form a full operations shift of three. This operations team will be responsible for operating the e-beam system and moving product through the warehouse. During this phase, we'll also add a shipping and receiving person who will be responsible for loading and unloading trailers, receiving orders into the system, preparing product for shipment, and ship and receive parts and supplies needed for the plan. What, for this case study, we expect commercial product volume to be relatively low during this phase. So this position could be added more towards uh, the end if needed. This phase will start with lots of training and employees will be qualified based on this training. The training will include simulated runs using the actual system, procedures and forms as they will be used during live operations. Safety training will be routine and drills will be conducted until the right responses become second nature to everyone. During this first year of operation, equipment problems will be more like, will likely require more support from our suppliers until the staff gains more experience. Also, operational efficiency will improve over time as operators get better at their jobs. During this important period, we'll emphasize to the staff 
that doing something slow and correct is okay. They'll get faster over time, but this is when habits form. So we need to make sure everyone forms good habits and not bad ones. During phase four, the plant staff will grow to 10 people and will be capable of pro processing product routinely. Now we move into phase five. I'll talk about the changes the plant will go through until it reaches full operating capacity over the course of the next three years. After the first year of operation, maintenance downtime hours and events will decline and the staff will become less dependent on support from our suppliers. Operational efficiency will also improve because of rigorous training and experience with actual commercial operations. As product volume increases, shifts will be added and the storage area will expand to meet the demand. By year four, the plant will reach its full operating potential. Once the core team is in place, the plant can process more product by adding operators. This creates leverage where a small increase in the total number of employees can produce a large increase in product processing volume. Notice the graph on screen. The green bar represents the total number of employees and the blue bar represents the potential product volume in cubic meters that can be processed. With 10 employees, the plant is capable of processing roughly 16,000 cubic meters. Adding another shift, our employee total increases to 13, but our volume output increases to 32,000 cubic meters. Adding another shift brings the employee total to 16 and the volume increases all the way up to 48,000 cubic meters. And by adding a fourth shift, this increases the employee total to 19 and our volume output increases to over 67,000 cubic meters. Of course, there may be good reasons to add other employees than operators in the future. But the point of this illustration is to demonstrate the leverage that can be used to substantially increase processing capability. Storage demands will also increase as product volume increases. If we assume the product will be in the warehouse for an average of three days, during the first six months of operation, we'll, we'll need around 50 pallets of storage space, which can be met with just six rows of single stack products. Note that these products must be segregated in a sterile, non-sterile warehouse as denoted by the, the fence on screen. During the first year of phase five, the storage demand will increase up to 150 pallets, which require two triple stack pallet rows and four double stack pallet rows. In the second year of phase five, the storage demand will increase to almost 250 pallets, requiring six triple stack pallet rows and four double stack pallet rows. And in the third year of phase five, we'll need 10 rows of triple stack pallets to meet a 350 pallet storage demand. By added, adding pallet racking as volume increases, we can spread out the cost over time. This brings us back to the importance of specifying nine meter or 30 foot tall ceilings when we designed our building. Although these high ceilings weren't needed initially, the decision made this storage expansion strategy possible. So at the end of phase five, our electron beam plant will be capable of operating at full capacity. And this brings our project in this presentation to a close. I hope this was helpful to anyone wondering what to expect when choosing to travel down this path. And I thank you and will be ha happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, uh, Pete, for this uh, great presentation. So this webinar was actually our last uh, webinar on eBeam. Don't forget our uh, next webinar next week on the 25th of March about X-ray versus other modalities. You can uh, already register um, from now for this uh, next webinar. And so now we have some time for uh, any uh, questions uh, you might have. Thank you. Thank you again to our lovely presenters, uh, Pete Baker and Candice Snagel. At this time, we do have time for Q&A, and I'd like to welcome our speakers to turn on their cameras and join us. Uh, thank you again for that great 
Insight. Um, again, for our attendees, you've got your Zoom uh, toolbar that is either on the bottom or the top of your screen. I would encourage you to uh, drop your questions in there for our speakers. I know they've also been uh, chatting back and answering some there. Uh, but again, feel free to drop your questions in. We've dedicated some time. I'll also be in touch with the uh, link to um, share for next week's webinar, which we will be hosting as well with IBA. Uh, so be in touch for that. That, but let's jump right into the uh, first question. Uh, so the questions that came through, and again, Pete, if you want to join us and turn on your camera, please feel free to do so. Uh, first question, is there a way to increase sterilization capacity if the volume exceeds expectations in the future? And Candice, I believe this question is for you. So again, uh, is there a way to increase sterilization capacity if the volume exceeds expectations in the future? Um, yeah, thanks, Brooke. So that, that's a very good question. So it really, it depends on the, the contractual capacity that you, uh, you have at the start and versus the maximum power of the equipment. So for example, in the case study that we, we've just been through, uh, the, the contractual capacity was 30, was 30 kilowatts and the maximum beam power of the equipment was 100 kilowatts. So, uh, so basically from a beam power perspective, there is a way to go uh, above in terms of um, uh, capacity, but it's very important to look at the, the product handling process because that is actually usually the, the first limiting factor. So when you design your system at the start, it's really important to try and assess you know, what could be the maximum uh, capacity you might want to reach in the future. And so then you, you design your product handling system in consequence so that you have this flexibility and it doesn't become a limiting factor too early. So it's, it's really important to, to think about the potential uh, future capacity in, uh, uh, in, yeah, in the future when you design your system. Lovely, thank you so much for that, Candice. Again, please continue to submit your questions in our Q&A feature, we've got some time. Uh, my next question is going to be for uh, Pete. Pete, thank you again for being here today. Uh, the question is, if the beam power is upgraded, how will this affect the operation that was described? So again, uh, just reading this aloud for all of our attendees, if the beam power is upgraded, how will this affect the operation that was described? Well, that's a good question. And I think uh, as Kenny's described that the beam power could be upgraded depending on the, on the, the machine sale and, and what the contract was. But if in this situation, if the if beam power was upgraded, it would have an impact on, on the throughput rate. So there could be you know, a, a need to automate uh, some of the handling, possibly much of the, uh, the handling, maybe moving the pallets to the line and out of the line, and also the, the empty pallets between the lines. There could be some simple automation there that might be able to handle it, but the bigger impact would probably be the storage capacity, uh, which it, it, you can see in that lot that we, we modeled out that we bought, well, the, the building would probably have to be expanded to the south, which could be done by just expanding that building out. You just have a little bit more storage capacity. Lovely, thank you for that, Pete. Uh, Candice, another question for you. What is the typical OEE for an E-beam facility? Um, again, great question. What is the typical OEE for an E-beam facility? So in, in terms of the overall equipment uh, effectiveness, so, so basically uh, that would encompass like, you know, the, the planned and, and unplanned downtime, but also on top of that, you need to consider, for example, the the idle time that you have between batches. So if you have a lot of small batches versus like, you know, big, like a, a lower number of like big, big batches is going to introduce like some, I would say lost time uh, that is, is different. So, so batch, you know, batch size is an important factor. And then any other, you know, typical like, you know, entering recipe and so on. That's also something you need to take into account in terms of the, you know, the overall effectiveness. Uh, so, so like a, a very rough number that we consider usually taking everything into account is 85%. But obviously, as I just explained, it's, it's very important to try and narrow down this number depending on the specifics of the, the product. And, and, and batch size, for example, is, a, is, is one, uh, you know, one type of element to take into consideration. 
Lovely. Thank you. And thank you so much to these attendees for these lovely questions. I'm going to keep going forward. Uh, Pete, question for you. Uh, in your building view, where does incoming product arrive and move? Can you describe the pathway through the sterilization equipment for non-sterile feed to final sterilized uh, product remove to storage for shipment? Uh, also, where are the, or I'm sorry, where are the uh, walking areas for employees and so forth? So again, in your building view, where does the incoming product arrive and move? Can you describe the pathway for the sterilization equipment? Um, and also, where are the walking areas for the employees? That's a good question, which, and it points out that segregation is, is an important aspect, especially in the medical, medical de, uh, device sterilization world. And in that drawing, I know it was kind of hard to see, uh, but there was a fence that's drawn in between, let's say it split that, that storage area in half, but it also extended over to the, to the load and unload stations in a way that, that again, it was hard to see and I can't not sharing my screen, in a way that, that separated the load and the unload station. And the floors were painted, there was a green and a red uh, paint. I guess when you review the slides, you could see it. So that there's a clear segregation there. And then there's a yellow pathway. Uh, so you would design it so that the storage area was a little bit off to the side uh, as in the drawing and then the pathway for, uh, was was drawn in, in yellow so yes the, the, the question uh, I guess the answer is is that certainly you want to have a distinct pathway when you have forklift traffic like this in a facility uh, and then uh, the dock doors themselves you want to make it so that the trucks can actually load from any dock door or unload so when they load they'll load into an area but then it'll go directly to uh, the non-sterile section of its loading and then unloading will come from the sterile section directly to the truck. Lovely. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, to all of our attendees, very quickly, I did drop a message in our chat feature, which has the registration link for next week's webinar, which again, we're hoping you can attend. Uh, feel free to copy and paste that. Again, we'll be in touch with that in an email afterwards, but just wanted to make it available to everyone while we're, st while we're still in this excellent Q&A. Um, I've got another question for an IBA team member, uh, Gino, who is going to come on the line and answer this great question that was submitted. Uh, Gino, welcome. If you want to unmute and turn on your camera quickly. The uh, question is asking, if beam power is upgraded, uh, shielding will have to be increased. Uh, we're asking. Uh, so again, if beam power is upgraded, shielding will have to be increased. Um, and again, Gino, I, I welcome you to join us and answer that question. Yes. If you like. Okay, I just have a problem with my, my camera. You can hear me? I can hear you perfectly. No problem about the camera. Thank okay, you. I will, uh, just start the, the video again. Well, actually, the main parameter that has to be considered when um, I would say designing the shielding is the beam energy. However, I would say the beam power plays also a smaller role. So typically what's uh, done is that when we design the, the shielding, we consider the maximum power of the equipment. So in the example shown earlier, um, where the beam, and the beam power was 30 kilowatts, but the rudder trunk can go up to 100, would definitely from the beginning design the shielding for 100 kilowatts. So that doesn't become a limiting factor. Thank you so much for that, Gino. Much appreciated, and we can see you. Thank you. Uh, another great question. I know we're getting close to time, but I want to get through as many of these excellent questions as I can. Uh, if anyone does need to jump off, again, this video will be available on the IBA Industrial YouTube page. Uh, this one, again, is for Pete Baker. Pete, uh, the storage capacity that was presented based on a three-day average turnaround time, if this changed to one day or seven days, for that matter, how much impact would this have on storage demand? Oh, you're muted, Pete. Sorry. <laughs> we know this happens. Oh, Technology. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> but I, but you could scale that number. Let's say if it's three, uh, we, we assume the three day turn or the product would stay in the warehouse for three days. If it's a one day turn, well, then that that really relaxes storage requirement by a factor of three. It's, it's you could scale it that easily. So a seven day turn would mean that, you know, that the product would be in that warehouse for more than two times as long as is the assumption there. And it, it, so we would have to expand that, uh, have a bigger warehouse for, the, for that. So it, it does make, make a big difference. And it's an important uh, component 
to look at when you're analyzing your, your uh, storage space uh, against expected volumes. Lovely, thank you for that. We did wanna take a quick poll with the attendees and then I'm gonna come back to Enrico's question, which I think is um, excellent on qualification for IQ, uh, OQ and PQ. But for all of our attendees, very quickly, we just wanted to launch a poll, get your feedback. So this will be coming on the screen. I'm gonna leave this open for um, just a minute or two. Again, please come back to your screen if you've just been watching. We want to get your feedback again on, is the webinar insightful? Um, um, we've included a few areas there for you to answer. Uh, my panelists, I'm not sure if I allowed you to answer, so feel free to, to answer the poll if it's up on your screen. But um, again, we're just looking for your feedback, um, if the presentation covered materials that you were asking for. Um, and again, for everyone, I have put a link in the chat for next week's webinar, which is going to be taking place on Thursday, the 25th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Um, again, the focus of next week's presentation is going to be uh, what X-ray brings to you, X-rays versus other modalities and comparison case study. Again, Thursday, March 25th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Um, I see that a bunch of you are responding, so I'm gonna leave this open for the next uh, 10 seconds or so, and then we'll get to our last question that we have time for. Um, again, if we didn't have time to get to all of your questions today, please don't hesitate to contact me at webinars at q1productions.com. Or again, our IBA and uh, Quantum um, EBX team have left their email addresses there. You can certainly feel free to reach out to them directly with any further questions, comments. Uh, but let me leave this open for another 10 seconds or so, and then we will get to our last question. Hope everyone's having an excellent Friday today. Thanks again for all of these polling answers. I'm gonna close this off. Um, so again, let's just drop them in. Great, thank you so much to everybody who participated in the poll. I'll be sharing those results with our IBA team um, in just a bit. Our last question that I think we've got time for here today, um, Pete, I'll be handing this one to you. How often, um, uh, how often do we need to, or I'm sorry, how often um, is requalification necessary for IQ, OQ, and PQ in the future time? Okay, that's a good question. And actually, the ref, one of the references I, I mentioned, the TIR 29, the Amy document, has a real good example. There's actually a matrix that, that lists what type of insulation, uh, what type of changes uh, could, could require uh, requalification. And it's most common, I think, for the, some of those IQ tests to be performed. Say if you do maintenance on, on a certain item, then uh, a scan with test may be required. But you don't necessarily have to repeat every other test. So that matrix in that, that reference document is a really good example of, of, of what systems will affect what. The uh, OQ typically would only be reperformed if, if a major change uh, uh, were to occur, where you basically would have to do everything all over again. And that's very, very rare. Uh, that would be like getting a new machine type of deal. Uh, and then PQ, that can change anytime you have a new product or if the product itself changes. And that's important because if there's a change in product geometry or, or, or uh, mass, a, a, a significant change, uh, you, you really, you have to uh, revalidate that product. Um, and that, that's an important thing, especially if you're working with customers, is that once you validate that product, it's a contract or an agreement between them is that, that they can't make changes to that product because you're basing a recipe off of that dose map. Uh, so any change would, would require a, a new dose map. Thank you so much for that, Pete. We certainly um, appreciate your answer uh, to that question. Um, I want to thank everyone for um, attending uh, today.